in some way or the other, if Satan wins us to his service, he must get us away from what the Word of God teaches. Some way or the other, he's got to do that. There's been various ways that he's accomplished that over the years among different peoples. But along about 40 years ago, thereabouts, there was a um, move, I guess you would say, within the body of Christ among certain ones, telling us that there is no New Testament pattern. And they spoke of pattern theology, put pattern theology in quotes, and they spoke of it in a derogatory way. Well, for a long, long time, the denominational world has not thought of the New Testament as a divine pattern. They've not upheld nor seen the scripturalness of the restoration principle. But all one is saying when they say a thing is a pattern is that it teaches something. That's all. And that's what a pattern does. It conveys an idea. It conveys information. In 1972, Rubel Shelley, under the heading of Liberalism's Threat to the Faith, published in Simple Studies Publishing Company, page 19, had this to say. There can be no spiritual fellowship between New Testament Christians and individuals or groups which teach anything other than the pure gospel of Christ. Worship in any manner other than authorized that authorized in the New Testament. Organize themselves differently from the pattern or organization set forth in Scripture and or live a worldly life. That was in 1972, and I don't mind saying a hearty amen to what he wrote then. In 1990, Shelley spoke the following words. Are we really looking for a pattern? We have taken acts and tried to make it a prison, a rigid pattern. Acts was not meant to be a pattern. I reject pattern theology. The scripture is not a book of case law to be cited like a bunch of proof texts. The way to teach people about the Bible is not to quote a series of steps to salvation. I am not looking for a pattern. I am looking for a person. Now, he said that in a sermon delivered at the Missouri Street Church of Christ, West Memphis, Arkansas, in a meeting there in April 20, uh, in 21 of 1990. Now, what he wrote in 1972 and what he said in 1990 cannot both be right. In one, he says, it is a pattern. The other, he says, I'm not looking for a pattern. Now, I am old enough, because he's only within a year or so of my age, I'm old enough to remember when he was young. <laughs> and I remember his teaching when he was young. But I also followed him as he began to change. And over the 70s decade, he changed, basically, from what I read here in 1972 concerning the Bible and the church to what he said in 1990 because actually he's on record of saying basically that same thing in the early 80s. So it was around a 10-year period that he did his changing. Well, he's only one, but he was a leader back in those days among several younger preachers as they would have been then. But this idea has been espoused by quite a number of people, and it still is to this day. 
So I want to study for a minute concerning does the New Testament represent a pattern to follow. I want you to keep in mind that the very idea of a pattern is that it is a way that information is disseminated to other people. If you have a dress pattern, women who sew, you know that you follow that pattern and the if you read those dress patterns and where you cut here and cut hair and there and something else, then you will have reproduced something. If you have a, a form such as a concrete form for steps, let's say, then when you have it set up and you put the concrete in it, that when it dries, you can take the form away and there it is. It shows the form. It just simply means something is transmitted whether it's from the standpoint of making a dress or a man's suit or whatever it might be, to whether it would be a blueprint for a building or whether it is a, a form for steps. It's still uh, causing something to be like something else. And the New Testament being a pattern in view of the very nature of words that we read and understand from those words, that all we're saying is a pattern gives you information to follow now what's interesting is that people will say well it's not a pattern well then when, once you reject it being a pattern and they tell you what they think a pattern is that's always very important then they must tell me what a pattern is they, if it, if they must tell me what the New Testament is if it's not a pattern because they're not going to rise up and say, the New Testament doesn't teach us anything. That'd be ridiculous. But when they say it's not a pattern, they're saying in some way it does not teach us. So they find themselves in a big mess. So I ask, what is the meaning of a pattern again? And let's just look at what Webster says. And I would suggest you consult any particular dictionary. Uh, and you'll find that it says something like this, quote, fully realized form, original, or model accepted or proposed for imitation. Now, are we willing to say the New Testament is not a book to be imitated insofar as what it teaches concerning the salvation of man and faithful Christian living? And if it is not, what is to be? Vine says in his book on Greek language, Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, he says there are three different Greek words for pattern in the New Testament. And those of us who've studied that and written on it over the years understand it's far more deep and uh, rich in its study than what I'm going to say here. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 7, he talks about tupas. Tupas. Well, we all remember, at least I guess we do, a typewriter and the keys on the typewriter. That when you hit, the, say, the B key, then it's designed to throw that little Tupas up there. And where it strikes, it makes an impression. So it has to do with the blow. Therefore, an impression. That's what you're doing when you tie it. And you got that idea given in John chapter 18 and verse 15. Another point, the impression of a seal, a stamp, or that which is made by a die, Acts 7 verse 43. In Romans 6, verse 17, it's a form or model. Same word, how it's translated in English. For it's the sense or substance of a letter, Acts 23, 25. And then in Acts chapter 7, verse 44, an example pattern. Now, that's one word, tupas. But in Greek, you change meanings of words by endings and by compound words and so forth. So you have what is called upotuposis, 
And that's used in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 16. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. Hupotuposis. But there's another one. And this is where you run across a lot of discussion of types and shadows. The book of Hebrews. Talking about the law of Moses particularly as a system of types and shadows. The... Old Testament being the shadow of the real thing in the New Testament. In Hebrews 9 and verse 23, we have another word. It's the same idea, but it's hupodegma. All of these give a little different flavor to the idea of a pattern or an impression left when something is struck. Well, let me ask some questions about the non-pattern view. It's been advocated for a good while. It still is by a lot of folks. When people tell me something, I learned this from G.K. Wallace. They come up saying something that is just is opposite from what the Word of God says it could be. Brother Wallace used to say, who told you that? When you tell me there is not a pattern, the New Testament's not a pattern, what or who says there is not a pattern? I mean, the Holy Spirit had these words and had the inspired writers write them. They're in the Scripture. Tupas, hupotoposis, and hupodagma. They're there. Those are the words the Holy Spirit actually had these writers select and use according to their vocabulary and saying what he wanted to be said. Now, what am I supposed to do about that? You say, well, let's just don't, let's just don't read the Bible anyway. Well, let's just say everybody in this room and everybody in the United States, we speak and read Koine Greek just like Paul did. Now, what are we going to do about that? Because when the Greek read that, he knew just exactly what was being said. He understood Tupas and so on. Does the Bible teach there's no pattern to follow? And if I were, if I were to hear somebody say that, and they would say, well, yes, it, it teaches there's no pattern to follow. Where does it teach it? We should not let people like this put us on the defensive. Just because somebody says, well, there's nothing to do with baptism in the Bible. I was like, who told you that? Where did you learn that? Or somebody says, well, sprinkling water on a person is what baptism is. Now, who told you that? The Bible was given to me and to you so we could understand God's mind on the matter. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. If the Bible does teach such a thing, does the Bible teaching that there is no pattern, now watch it. Does the Bible teaching that there is no pattern actually constitute a pattern for us to accept? Now think about that for a minute. In effect, they're saying the Bible doesn't teach this. The Bible teaches that. But their point is the Bible doesn't teach. That's what they're trying to get away from. They're trying to say you cannot go and find explicit things or even implied things that you can say a man must believe and a man must do or not do as the case may be or you won't go to heaven. That's what they don't want said. So they come up and say, well, the Bible's just a narrative. Well, what does that prove? It's the inspired Word of God. It's God's Word. God, through men by the Holy Spirit, gave us His will. And I learned the mind of God from the Word of God. And if I'm going to know the mind of God relative to what I must do to be saved and to live the Christian life, then i got to know the Word of God. If there is no divine pattern, the question also comes up, am I free to reject the teaching, the pattern, that says there is no pattern? Or am I legally bound to believe that there is no pattern? You see what happens? The position they take pretty much says, keep the Bible shut. And just look at it and say, there it is. But don't ever try to figure out what he's telling me to do or not do. 
And yet when I understand the Bible's teaching concerning what I must do and not do, then I realize that's exactly what it's designed to do, is to tell me what I must do or not do. And if you say, well, no, it's not to do that, well, then what is it supposed to do? How do, I, how do you know when you've obeyed God and when you haven't? And what did Jesus mean when he says, if you love me, keep my commandments? What commandments? Or, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. How do you do that? How do you do something by the authority of Jesus Christ? Jesus said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? It can't be clearer than that. But the Bible's not a pattern, the New Testament in particular. But pattern means teach. Teach means convey knowledge, convey information. What did those people expect on the day of Pentecost when they were convicted that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Messiah, the Son of God, and that they were in sin? They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, who knows? It says they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching. What was that? We're to contend for the faith, which is one way of referring to the New Testament or the gospel, the word of God. We're to contend for the faith. What does that mean? What should I stand up for? The existence of God, the deity of Christ, the plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures, the final authority of the scriptures. Well, if I do that, how do I do it? If I ask, or you ask me, or someone asks somebody, what must I do to be saved by Jesus Christ? I can't direct it into the Bible. Because what they did 2,000 years ago, who knows now? Next point. If there are no patterns for worship, as well as our day-to-day -day service. How can there be perversions of the same? Think for a moment. How do you pervert something when that something you don't know what the world is? It, it, it's nebulous. How do you pervert it? But the Bible says you can, and it's wrong to do it. That implies there's something fixed and it should not be changed. How would you contend for the faith? The New Testament system of salvation, when all that is nebulous, you don't even know what it is. How do you know there is a Lord's Supper that is to be observed to show forth the death of Christ and it come again in the worship assembly of the Lord's people on the first day of the week? How do you do that? Everything I just said depends upon the static standard that is the objective truth of the Bible, or I couldn't even ask that question. Can the Lord's Supper actually be corrupted? Can, in corrupting it, I make it void? The people in Corinth did. They were turning the Lord's Supper into just a common meal. Paul says, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. How do you know, Paul? Are you trying to hold us to a pattern? Look at 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 24. I'm not going to read that now, but that's where Paul quotes again where the Lord instituted the supper and where he's correcting the perversions the Corinthians have done in it. Well, they couldn't pervert it if there's no set way to do it. How do you pervert something if there is no set way to do it? Question, were the Corinthians bound before God to do what Paul told them to do? To be instructed by Paul because they had perverted the Lord's Supper and they needed to correct that and come back to the way it was, as we say today, supposed to be done? Who would say... The Corinthians were perfectly acceptable to God as they were free to ignore Paul's instructions. Well, certainly they were not. Now, if they didn't change, if they didn't repent of their sins, which means they've left 
a static standard of truth in some way and they needed to change and come back to it, would they be acceptable to God if they didn't change, repent, and come back to the truth they had left or they had perverted? Will today God accept our conduct, whether it's worship or day-to-day -day service, if we do not abide in the static standard of truth that never changes? What did Jesus mean when he says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How would there be any communication among us if that's just the way the Bible is? I could read to you some something from the Bible and it would make you a bit of difference. And what difference would it make what I'm preaching right now? If there is no pattern taught in the scriptures. Well, let's move from religious things. Sometimes people can see in moral matters what they can't see in religious matters. Is there a pattern for moral behavior? Does the Bible teach or give limits to moral behavior? Well, we've already participated in Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs this afternoon. Usually we do every worship period in which we encourage one another uh, God, uh, bad language disdain. God's name hold in reverence. Trying to encourage us to live according to a specific pattern of conduct. Well, when you say, is there such a thing as moral behavior? If you say no, then how does any one of us differ from a rooster or a hen, if you, whichever way you want to go there, a dog <laughs> or a cat? Or a bull, or even a bullfrog. What, what, really, what's the difference? May I, may I kill a person who says there's no pattern of moral behavior? The Nazis tried that when they were judged at Nuremberg. That was their defense. You people who are the allies are judging us by your laws. We were under the laws of our government in Germany, which was the Nazi laws, when we did what we did. So how dare you judge us? Well, guess what? It was pointed out to them there was a higher law than simply civil law. By that, all men are judged. If I were to murder somebody, would I be an immoral person if I did? If people commit fornication, is that immoral? A lot of folks evidently in this nation <laughs> seem no problem with that. Well, back to salvation, being forgiven of sins. Is Jesus Christ of Nazareth a pattern for salvation? Does the Bible represent our Lord's life as well as his death? as a pattern of forgiven sins, salvation, our salvation? Or are we free to follow the teachings of Buddha or be a Hindu, any of those, rather than Christ? What did Christ mean when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No man comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. You know, that, that's a way right there, just taking that one verse, that you can get all sorts of things uh, hushed up or started one way or the other according to the person that hears it and what he believes when he hears it. Try it on a Buddhist who likes to think everything's all right and then just say, well, what did Christ mean when he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, you might want your bulletproof vest on, but try that on a Muslim. And look at him and say, plainly, Jesus Christ of Nazareth said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That seems pretty static, objective, and unchangeable. If Christ is the Lord in any sense, 
must, must we do what he says? Luke 6, 46. Matthew 7, 21, and so on. If the blood shed by Christ on Calvary's cross is the basis and pattern for salvation, one simple question, how do we determine this? If Christ is the ground of salvation and the pattern of deliverance for us, deliver us from sins, this question, by what process do we learn that there is no pattern for the conditions of salvation? You see, it all comes back to pretty much saying, let's get rid of anything that stops me from doing as I please just as long as I think I'm doing it toward God. I have a good feeling toward God that I'm doing it. God needs to apologize to Cain. Because Cain built an altar and offered sacrifices on it to God. That was the kind of worship they did in those days. But it wasn't acceptable. But his brother Abel offered what was acceptable. And why was it acceptable? Well, Hebrews 11 tells us why. It was by faith. And faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And that was written aforetime time for our learning before we ever get the New Testament. But the principle comes right over to the New Testament. Because faith in every way that God has dealt with man has always been produced by proper evidence and credible witnesses. And that's what happened. Abel simply heard God, understood God's word, and obeyed it. Cain heard it, understood it, and disobeyed it. That's the way it always has been, whether it's been the patriarchal age, the Jews under the mosaical system, or today in the Christian dispensation under the authority of Christ in the New Testament. So I go back again and remind you that God has always given man a pattern. You think of going to Noah's day and you read about the ark commanded by God and all of the way it was to be built and what it was to be built out of. And in Genesis 6, uh, beginning 14, but I'm thinking specifically of verse 22, Concerning what God told Noah to do in building the ark, thus did God according to all that, uh, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. My question is why? If there's no pattern today, why was there a pattern then? But you come on down to the giving of the law, and God gave Moses a pattern for building the tabernacle. And we read in Exodus chapter 25, verses 9 and 40. Listen to this. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Then he said in verse 40, And look that thou make them after their pattern which was showed thee in the mount. And that's used by the writer of Hebrews to say we're to follow the New Testament teaching as Moses or the children of Israel followed the Mosaical teaching, which would include Moses. And you'll remember also during that 1,500-year period between the patriarchal and the beginning of the Christian dispensation that during that age God charged Israel with rigid accountability to his law. And any departure from it was severely censured. Deuteronomy 4, 2, and chapter 5, verses 32 through 33, and a multiplicity of other places. Now, at the dividing of the kingdom, whether there was a northern kingdom or a southern kingdom, Jeroboam, who became the king of the ten northern tribes, in fact, he was the first one, is a prime and, I think, very clear example of how God thinks toward those that depart from his law. And you can see in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 25 through 33, 
that God condemned him severely. Now, that was written for your learning and my learning as to our attitude toward the teaching of the New Testament. What am I supposed to do about that? When I say there's no pattern, the New Testament is no pattern at all. When you look at what Jeroboam did, first of all, he changed the manner of worship. He, secondly, changed the very place of worship. And the third thing was he chose priests from a tribe other than the tribe Moses said they were to come from, which is the tribe of Levi. And fourthly, he changed the time of the Feast of the Tabernacles. And I'm sure there's somebody saying, well, these are just a few changes in their mind, or what big difference is it? That's the way people think. But when you read through, such as 1 Kings 14, 6, if you want to count them, try it. 21 times. 21 times. The Old Testament mentions that Jeroboam, who made Israel to sin. How did he do it? He departed from the divine pattern that was the law of Moses, the way that Israel approached God. The early church of the first century, not long after it was established, Acts 2, is commended for continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2, verse 42. We don't do any violence to that scripture to say according to the apostles' pattern, saying the same thing. And as a consequence of staying with what the apostles taught, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, Acts 4, verse 32. And I make bold to say this afternoon that that's the only way God's people will ever be of one heart and one soul is when they appeal all to the same authority and they all do just exactly what Jesus Christ authorized them to do. Now, that suggests strongly unity of practice when it comes to religious matters. The Romans had been made free from their sins. I don't, think, I don't know of anybody that would say they hadn't been. You read the book of Romans. But notice they were made free from their sins by obeying that form of doctrine. You know what the Greek word is? Tupas. Romans 6, 17 and 18. And they were not made free from their sins till they obeyed that form of doctrine doesn't make any difference how many denominational seminaries teach their preachers otherwise or how many of them preach it. Listen, that's what God's Word says. And the American Standard Version 1901 has pattern in the footnotes. Uh, I believe that's pattern theology. The saints in Rome were admonished to mark them which caused divisions and offenses Contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, Romans 16, 17. Well, if it's a nebulous thing, the doctrine of Christ, there's no pattern to it, how do you know what to compare and contrast so you'll know what's right and what's wrong? And if there's no New Testament pattern of doctrine, then how could one ever be able to turn away from it or turn back to it or even know how to practice it? Paul told the Corinthians that they were not to think of men above that which is written, the way the American Standard translates that. They were not to go beyond, rather, the things that are written. How do you go beyond things that are written? If there's not a divine pattern, if words don't mean things, if the mind of God's not conveyed to us that I want this done a certain way. If buried in baptism does not mean buried in baptism, what does buried in baptism mean? The Galatians were strongly urged to walk by this rule, Galatians 6.16. Now Thayer in his Greek-English lexicon defines rule, Hanon, as a definitely bounded or fixed space within the limits of of which one's power or influence is confined. The promise assigned one sphere of activity, any, listen, rule or standard. 
Thus I find the Holy Spirit guiding Paul in writing to the church at the Philippians saying that they were to walk by the same rule, Philippians 3.16, which would be the same as saying walk by the same standard or follow the same pattern. Paul warned the Thessalonians, as well as Timothy, young preacher, of a great falling away in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3, or a departure from the faith, 1 Timothy 4, 1. Well, as I said earlier in the lesson, the faith, such as in Jude 3, 2, refers, uh, Jude 3 also, refers to that system of truth, the apostles' doctrine, that which was by the Holy Spirit delivered to the apostles of Christ, Galatians 1.23. Now, if there's no set pattern of doctrine, and I've asked this one way or the other all the way through this sermon, how do you depart from it? You think some people, it's like being in a, in a pond or a body of water and you're in a boat and somebody tells you, do not jump out of this boat. You don't know how to swim, and it's 10 feet deep here. If there's no communication of what to do or what not to do in view of your condition, you might just jump out of the boat. In fact, how do you know what jumping out of the boat is? How do you know what getting in the boat is? How do you know what the boat is? How do you know you're you? And that's where people are nowadays. As the philosophy student turned in his paper at the end of the semester, or it was a test, to his teacher, he asked the teacher, am I really here? The teacher looks up at him very kindly and says, who wants to know? So if the church has the option of continually modifying biblical truth, how could one ever fall away from it? Well, first of all, how would you ever find it? As we close the lesson, notice Paul admonished Timothy to hold fast the form. I referred to this earlier. Hupo, tuposis. Hold fast the form or pattern, as it is in English, of sound words, which means wholesome teaching. 2 Timothy 1.13. Timothy was instructed to abide in these things. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, these same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And that carries it right on down to now and to the end of time. Timothy was to charge men not to teach a different doctrine, 1 Timothy 1, 3. Now a question, how can he do this if there's no pattern? The Hebrew writer affirms that Moses was admonished to God, I referred you to this earlier, to make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount, Hebrews 8, 5. I want to remind you that the tabernacle was a type of the church. Now, do we, who are the recipients of a better covenant, which is the New Testament system, Hebrews 7, 22 and chapter 8, verse 6, do we have a lesser responsibility as we strive to serve God as members of his church? Whosoever transgresseth, or as American sin said, goeth onward, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds, Second John 9 through 11. Those people who teach us there's no inspired divine pattern are people who are false teachers. They are actually, when you take what they teach and apply it consistently, are just pretty well saying all you can get out of the Bible is that God loves you. You're a sinner and you can't save yourself. 
Christ can save you. But really, if they're true logically to their position, they can't even include that. Anything goes. If there's no set doctrine and pattern, then how could one determine if a person is bringing a different pattern than what God wants or some other doctrine? And the answer is you couldn't. There is a pattern. This pattern is not obsolete. It will last till the end of the world, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. By that pattern, that divine pattern, that inspired pattern, all of us are going to be judged at the last day. So Jesus said in John 12, 48. That pattern, that teaching of Jesus lives and abides forever. 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25. As is said in June 3, it has been once for all delivered, American Standard. There's nothing added to it anymore. No latter-day revelations. You have your New Testament, that's it. God hasn't revealed anything since he closed the book of Revelation. It's important that we understand these things. And I'll end right where I began. In order for the devil to get you to go to hell and be with him, he must get you away from the Bible. One of those ways is saying that the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, the New Testament, doesn't have to be obeyed. You say, well, they didn't say that. When they say it's not a pattern, they say it doesn't teach what God wants you to do, there is no objective, absolute standard, Thus, we call on God about any way we please. And he's going to accept us. You can't find that in the Bible. Why call you me Lord, Lord, Jesus said, and do not the things which I say. Can't get clearer than that. If you need to obey the gospel this afternoon, then now's the time to do it. You read your Bible, you can know that gospel. You can know the steps in it. That is how you become a Christian and exactly when you do. As a child of God, you can know whether you're living faithful or not. Thus, we simply always appeal and remind one another, don't let people lead you astray. And if we have a book like this, how much time are we spending with it in studying to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. It should be a book most cherished because it reveals the mind of our loving Heavenly Father. So if you need to come to Christ this afternoon or repent of your sins as an erring child of God, we invite you to do so while we stand and while we sing.